Hi, I'm Thomas Bowles, Prince William County Agricultural Extension Agent. Welcome to our video. Thank you for um, your concern for Lake Montclair by joining us here tonight. You have an unusually strong group of well-educated board members, and um, they happen to be, some of them happen to be master gardeners and master naturalists too. And I encourage you to call on them for um, information about this topic and, and me as you decide to move forward with your management plans. So my plan tonight is to give you the best research-based information on solutions to algal blooms, issues that you've been experiencing. And I'm gonna uh, take a lot of information from Virginia Tech and Virginia State University. We are an extension of th that, that facility. And, um, but also I'm gonna synthesize information from uh, Natural Resources Conservation Service, uh, Department of Forestry, Department of Wildlife Resources, Department of Environmental Quality, and our own watershed branch in Prince William County. So the reason is for the presentation and for my, the invitation I received were concerns about algal blooms in Lake Montclair that, that um, prohibit swimming or other recreation in the lake and to provide you with some best practices for managing the lake. Um, I'm going to encourage residents to work together uh, to establish a healthier lake and a buffer uh, zone that will protect the lake better. And the solutions that I'm going to offer are not a Band-Aid approach, but a, a long-term approach to improve the quality of the water and the quality of life for Montclair residents. So a little review of algae. Algae are plant-like, but they're not plants. They're simple protists. They're organisms and they're found in salt water and fresh water. And um, it, it's no, they're a normal part of a fresh water or salt water ecosystem. And, but with the right circumstances, they can produce a bloom, which in turn uh, has harmful effects on people, fish, shellfish, mammals, birds, and can cause human um, illnesses, although rare. Um, they can be debilitating. Sometimes they can even be fatal. So uh, Buck Arvin is um, seeing to chemical testing and uh, sampling for algae in Lake Montclair. And this was the latest, uh, these are the latest results for, on 517. Um, and these, I, I need to stress that these are not at dangerous levels right now, uh, but they are present. So. Um, uh, when conditions change, um, they could uh, produce more of a bloom. So cyclotella is actually a, not a, really an algae. It's a diatom. So diatoms have a silica shell. You can see the top right picture shows a diatom, but they can be any um, number of shapes. Uh, if you Google diatoms, uh, freshwater diatoms on uh, and look at some of the pictures they're they're really beautiful and each one of those um, cavities is a silica uh, has a silica um, border on it and then as they break down um, that silica falls to the bottom of the ecosystem of the water uh, table and then um, becomes sand um, most of these are non-toxic um, the other uh, algae that was sampled was actually not an algae either. It was a cyano or a blue-green uh, algae, a phantomenis and non. Uh, and um, given the right conditions, again, the, this can create a bloom uh, as it grows rapidly. Uh, and the right conditions include sun, nutrients, and blue-green algae prefer warm, calm, sunny days and water temperature is higher than 75 degrees. And um, so we've had some cooler temps and some warmer temps, but it hasn't been consistently, um, water temperature hasn't been consistently above 75 probably for very many days. The blooms often occur in summer or early fall, but they can occur at other times of year if the conditions are right. So that blue-green algae or cyanobacteria uh, contains 
it's possible to have three classes. There's three types of toxins. And again, cyanobacteria does not have to be toxic, um, but these are the ones that are, are toxic, do contain toxins. And uh, neurotoxins is one type of toxin uh, that can cause neurological damage. Uh, peptide hepatoxins can cause damage to the liver, and that's most common in free water lakes. Uh, dermatotoxins can cause skin irritations, respiratory issues, and I, I do have a friend that lived in Montclair, lives in Montclair, and she has children that were lifeguards, so they were standing in the water for long periods of time, and they did experience um, month to month and a half long uh, skin irritations that really was hard to uh, get rid of. So as with any environmental problem, uh, it's easier to um, prevent it than clean it up. The national cost for cleaning up blooms in the U.S. is about $4.6 billion. So I'm going to give you some, some recommendations on how to prevent it. So an algal bloom is also called eutrophication, that they're just synonymous. And again, not algae create harmful blooms. Um, and some blooms are natural, some are caused by uh, humans. Uh, remember, algae, even though they're not plants, they're photosynthetic like plants. And they take energy uh, or sugars from the sun to produce oxygen. And the algal bloom is just an overgrowth of that algae or algae-like bacteria or the, the diatoms. Depending on the type, it can have a smell uh, and it can look like foam or froth or more like a paint slick. Um, there, are, there are naturally occurring chemical reactions when uh, fresh water breaks down uh, leaf, leaf matter, and that can create a foam, but that's, you know, that's, that's not um, produced by the algae. Uh, so, and that's perfectly normal, a normal process in a freshwater ecosystem. It can be any number of colors, yellow, brown, pink, or red. You've heard of red tide in Florida. Well, that, that's an algal bloom um, that, that has some toxicity. So some causes of eutrophication are, are um, things you can control and things you can't control. I'm going to name the ones that we can control first. Uh, runoff of lawn and garden fertilizers, uh, pet waste, wildlife waste, all of which are nutrients um, that feed that algae, uh, pollution, or a change in water flow. The, the warmer the water, um, the more... Uh, quickly cyanobacteria or blue-green algae will grow, and the more sunlight it's absorbed, it will grow even faster. So still water or slow-moving water with layers uh, it, that it layers out and it, with the warmer water ends up on top, and that, that creates a, a top growth of algae. The less water flowing um, uh, or al alterations in the watershed can cause still water. Um, We've had a lot of drought uh, off and on um, since 1999, and, and uh, many trees and um, processes in our environment have been uh, stressed because of that. So bigger storms also increase the runoff on land, and that will in turn increase the nutrients entering the lake if, if there's excess nutrients available. So I don't want to. Um, I don't want to omit sedimentation, which is another factor. If um, ground is not covered, uh, then uh, runoff and erosion, as you know, can occur, and that can just that can cover over fish reproductive areas and food sources and wreak havoc uh, with the habitat. Uh, cloudy water can also create algal algal blooms when the dissolved oxygen is used up. Uh, it reduces the useful storage in reservoirs and makes dredging uh, necessary. And um, with proper management of the land around a lake, it should not need regular dredging um, very often. Lakes do go through a, a natural process in succession, so at, it, it is possible that it would need it, but not, not regular dredging which is expensive. It clogs and it alters the health of the streams that are nearby. 
reducing aquatic life and upsetting that balance. And soil particles carry nutrients, pesticides, and herbicides. You might think of it like a magnet attracting a bunch of paper clips. Um, that's what happens. There's a chemical charge for the soil particles and those nutrients, pesticides, and herbicides. And it's actually attracted. And so when the soil runs off, it brings with it the nitrogen and pesticides and herbicides with it into the water. So your, your property value depends on how clean Lake Montclair is. I think I heard it said that, uh, you know, Lake Montclair is Lake Montclair, uh, Montclair community is, is about Lake Montclair. And without that lake, it's just another aging community. So preserving this preserves your property value, but it also gives you, um, opportunities for recreation, and even more so, um, there, there are some health risks that come with um, being in water that, that has pollutants in it. So one of the simplest and best ways to reduce the effects of polluted runoff and algal blooms is to establish a vegetated buffer or to enhance the buffers that are already existing. And we're going to spend a good amount of time on that talking about that topic. So there, this is what the research says about preventing algal blooms and eutrophication. A riparian buffer that's properly maintained will filter, uh, slow down stormwater, protect the soil, um, and it stabilizes the banks, decreases the storm energy, it filters nutrients, and it provides habitat um, for, for wildlife. It can also increase your property value and it can look beautiful. And generally, the wider the buffer, the more effective it will be. So a little bit of history, the Chesapeake Bay Preservation Act from 1988 and then followed by the ord ordinance in 1990 indicate, um, regulated that a vegetated buffer of no less than 100 feet be adjacent to tidal wetlands, tidal shores, non-tidal wetlands, and other water bodies with flow, and that includes lakes, reservoirs, um, streams, wetlands, and this protects against um, pollution, deposition of sediment, and um, you're in a very unique position in Lake Montclair because Powell's Creek Watershed uh, intersects like is intersected by Lake Montclair, and it serves as a nursery for many of the important aquatic organisms that keep our water clean and uh, keep it alive and and um, and uh, healthy for us to use. And it makes a significant comp contribution to the Potomac River and the Chesapeake Bay. This is what our county document says about. Uh, resource protection areas, and that's just a repair and a protected riparian area adjacent to a body of water or a wetland. And uh, property owners are not allowed, to, oh, with, within that 100 foot buffer, property owners are not allowed to add new development or a parking lot. They're not permitted to clear cut trees, to fill and grade, or to establish a lawn in that 100 foot buffer. And any changes in the buffer um, that that might be included in this list here of, you know, building a dock or a beach or a pier or any rebuilding projects or, or sheds or removing uh, any vegetation uh, must requires uh, county review and approval. And if you're going to re remove invasive, you have to have a plan in place. Um, in writing that you, it'll be replaced with native vegetation. You can read more about this document on what the regulations are in the county at this website here. And that's um, uh, part of the uh, watershed branch uh, uh, pages on, on the internet. So again, generally the wider the buffer, the greater the benefits. As you get close to the lake or the stream, some short vegetation, uh, um, not too short, not like turf grass, but, um, you know, uh, a good 12 inches or more uh, will stabilize that bank and filter out some of the sediment and some of the nutrients that are uh, run, running down that hill. And, and 
many of you have really very slow properties. Keep in mind that we're not asking you to put in a forest, but as a benchmark, forests are the best ecosystem, best stormwater system, because the, the water, the, the rainwater, no matter how hard it is, spreads out that water as it hits the leaves and the trees, and it spreads it out, slows it down, and it soaks it in instead of letting it run off and, um, and into, you know, downhill. There's other benefits too to shrub and shrub, tree and shrub buffers. Um, leaf litter is incredibly important for uh, improving the soil and providing cover for overwintering animals. The animals pictured over at the right are um, a, a five line skink, a hair streak butterfly, a lightning bug, and you can see some sedges down there uh, that that are holding that leaf litter in place at the very bottom. Well. These, these are just a few of the uh, critters that um, require a leaf litter to survive, and they live amongst the leaf litter. I, I, have, I have a grandson, and I want very much for him to be able to see butterflies and to appreciate um, lightning bugs and the magical way they light up in the summertime. Vegetation that's covered with soil and leaves will bind those ex excess nutrients to the soil and that it holds fertilizers and other sources of nitrogen too. Um, a forested buffer or, or that a riparian area that has adequate vegetation and no bare soil can be uh, 10 to 15 times greater infiltration than just a plain fescue or bluegrass lawn. It takes a lot to maintain a lawn. A, a lawn um, is a high input crop. It needs to be fertilized annually. It won't grow in shade. So um, that ends up having bare, bare spots and bare soil. Native plants, um, putting them in initially can be an expense, although I'm going to show you some ways that you can uh, minimize that cost. And we're not going to put in an acre, but an acre can cost $3,000 uh, to put in and maintain. But non-native plants that you'll need to replace um, and that aren't doing any benefit from the ecosystem um, are, uh, end up being much more expensive. Uh, native plants also provide seeds and, and food for birds and nectar for um, our pollinators. These are not... Um, Practices that I recommend. I know you're getting ready to have a dredge of your of Lake Montclair because of all the sedimentation, but dredging um, shouldn't need to be done as often um, as it's it as you you are being required to do it to keep um, the the lake healthier. So dredging, I would consider a band-aid approach, and it's more of a um, you know, reaction to poor practices rather than a, a solution. So adding colorant to the water, something like a product called AquaShade, you can dye the water yeah, um, blue or black, but it, but it does block um, the sunlight and that causes algae to, to stop um, receiving that sunlight and, and proliferating. But if it's all blocked at one time, the dye can cause a fish kill because of the lack of oxygen and, and, and a terrible smell from the rotting uh, vegetation. So we can't control some factors. There are many important factor, factors though that you can control. And I'm, those are the ones we're gonna focus on next. You can start with the easy, cheap step. Stop mowing next to the lake. Allow grasses and that that probably is not going to be a turf grass, but just stop mowing whatever is next to the lake for a 50 to 100 foot buffer. Stop removing any existing trees and vegetation unless you get an approval and have a plan ahead of time. Fixing this eutrophication is very expensive, but this simple step of allowing the grass to grow up and leaving it that way all year um, will save headache and money in the long term. It's such an easy thing to do. So longer term solutions, you can put in some herbaceous plant 
and that might, or you, you might want to add tr uh, layers of trees, shrubs, and it doesn't have to obstruct your view. There are plenty of trees and shrubs that are shorter or can, uh, are kind of see-through. Um, if you reduce the lawn and replace with these deep-rooted native plants, um, it, it will hold the soil much more effectively than non-natives will. Shallow roots of turf are if you can see this fescue turf here, hardly any any grab of the soil with those roots. They're so minimal. Um, but native um, grasses, uh, you see prairie drop seed here is, is used, but there's several other native grasses that I'm going to recommend. And they do a very good job of holding the soil and filtering out the nutrients. So they're doing a, a type of remediation. Um, as they absorb those nutrients. It ought, these also cover bare soil, which will reduce sedimentation. So I know you have problems with geese too, uh, and they like to use your shoreline, and their preference is to have short vegetation at the water's edge, so they can look around and they can see predators coming, they can lay their eggs there and know that the eggs are gonna be safe from snakes, or other birds of prey, or other predators, uh, neighborhood cats. And lawns are the perfect thing if you're going to have um, geese. Um, no short grass, no geese. They're not going to um, want to establish their home um, in, a, in a place that has taller grass, like a riparian buffer. Uh, a buffer slip can, uh, strip can also uh, include warm net warm season grasses, native grasses, wildflowers, trees, and shrubs. And I'll show you some designs for that in a little bit. So native warm season grasses stay green during the warm season. And then they turn um, usually a golden or sometimes a uh, bronze color. And they look pretty all times of year. But they must stay at the height um, that they are at their mature height in order to be effective. If you mow them, they'll, that will reduce the effectiveness and the uh, geese will come back. So trees and shrubs, I'm going to recommend you look at only uh, native trees and shrubs um, and that you choose carefully. Uh, Virginia Cooperative Extension, we can help you make those choices and I'll show you some other resources for that. Um, the leaves catch the rainfall and the roots absorb the water. This slows down any stormwater surge uh, and it provides habitat. Um, we like to assess the plant community. We went to the Island Homeowners so Association to about three or four houses and looked at what plant communities were already there and then made our recommendations about what to put in uh, to add to that plant community. Plants. Certain plants um, like to grow together, and it's dependent on the soil and the geology and the sunlight and the, the just the growing conditions. But also, it might historically be like a beach forest, and so we know that beach forests have a certain plant community. Now, not everybody needs to um, put in an oak. But oaks um, are incredibly important keystone species for, for growing, and, and they are a good choice if you have the room for an oak. Be they are host to about 532 species of caterpillars, and these caterpillars are needed for bird breeding. Um, trees also provide nectar and pollen for our, pol our important pollinators. So... The reason that we need the caterpillars is this is just one example of a, a group of birds that requires caterpillars, 6,000 to 9,000, just to feed one family of chickadees. Uh, and that she might have multiple broods a year. So um, we, when I first started working with extension, people would call about leaves being eaten. And the whole a concept has changed. Now we look at um, if if leaves are being eaten, then um, then something is living there, and that means it's an ecosystem. If nothing in your garden is being eaten, most likely you have you're either using pesticides um, or you 
uh, are using, you have non-native plants um, that are not filling a niche, a necessary niche. So grasses and um, perennials um, benefit pollinators and songbirds, um, and they provide seasonal interest. They provide cover, pollen, nectar, um, and it raises your property values. There's, there's um, a growing trend uh, of people wanting to put native plants in and, and a, a truly a, a, a changed paradigm for people that are gardening to um, not only make our landscapes beautiful, but make them uh, useful and um, an important um, ecosystem for our wildlife and insects and pollinators. The more natural the condition of the buffer, the greater species diversity will use it. Here's, here's um, uh, some leaf litter uh, and some moss and some Japanese invasive honeysuckle and a box turtle. A fertilized and manicured lawn as opposed to this uh, that would be a, a adjacent to a shoreline would provide none of these benefits for habitat or stormwater. In fact, 80% of our birds are dependent or partially dependent on a riparian area, according to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife. But I know that lawns are important for, for, for recreation, and some people like the way they look. And if you're going to have a lawn in some of your areas, um, we want you to make sure that you um, are managing it correctly uh, for, with water quality in mind and maybe border it with a buffer of trees and shrubs. We recommend fertilizing in the fall. This is research-based information on good turf care, not in the spring. We recommend that you fertilize only based on a soil test because we're basing any recommendations on science. What it, what's in the soil already, what needs to be added. And so we have a best lawns program, and I'm gonna tell you more about that uh, in a, just a second, but here's the email if you want to get an application, or you can go to the Prince William County website and download an application there. Just put in best lawns as under the search terms. Avoid, again, stop mowing to the edge of the lake. Uh, so here's our best lawns program. It stands for Building Environmentally Sustainable Turf. It includes a site visit by master gardeners, uh, a soil test, from the Virginia Tech Soil Lab. Master Gardeners collect that. They do a turf and weed assessment of your turf area. They measure exactly the turf, omitting a decks and sidewalks and planting beds because we, want, we don't want to over apply. We only want to apply the right amount of fertilizer at the right time of year so that the roots take it up. And um, then, then staff prepare a unique nutrient management plan and it has uh, information on wheat, specific wheat control, how much lime and fertilizer, that's how many bags, what type, and, and really uh, succinct, specific recommendations. And if you have shady areas that you can't grow turf, you need about six to eight hours of sun to grow turf, we'll give you recommendations for some alternatives, uh, ground covers. And you, you are in an environmentally sensitive site if you live near Lake Montclair. And we'll take that into consideration when we make our recommendations. You can also provide, you can do this plan yourself, or you can um, give it to your lawn care company. And as the customer, you can tell them this is what you want and you don't want extra services. This is, this is um, research-based information from Virginia Tech that we can provide to you through our Master Gardener volunteers. So the Virginia Code in 2011 was changed so that um, the, it prohibits now the sale of lawn fertilizer that contains phosphorus, except when you're establishing a new lawn. And there are very few new lawns being established in Montclair as an older community, so you should not be using any fertilizer with the phosphorus. And the best lawns plan that we will provide, um, should you choose to do the um, program, is um, will not contain phosphorus. This is what your label should read. Uh, the nitrogen and the potassium should have a percentage by it, but phosphate should be zero. 
uh, phosphorus runs off easily. It it um, binds to uh, sediment. It binds to with the herbicides, and it creates a dead zone in bodies of water. So I'm going to show you some pictures now of some landscape solutions, and these come from a book called The Green Book for, let's see, The Green Book, let me see, let's see, anyway, let's, let's, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a reference for that in just a minute. This is, this is um, a riparian area that has a switchgrass in it, which is a native warm season grass. It holds the soil well, it um, creates less erosion, it absorbs the water that comes and, and the nutrients before it can get to the um, lake. And it can be grown uh, in poor, poor soil, clay soil. It's, it's a really good nesting um, place for uh, fish habitat, uh, for the critters that fish like to eat, but it's not preferred by Canada geese. So it, it's green in the summer during the warm months, and then it turns kind of golden in the fall and into the winter, and you should leave it in place all winter. Little blue stem is another native warm season grass. It can be kind of bluish, purplish, um, and but it turns kind of golden, orange, bronzy in the fall, winter. Uh, Big blue stem is kind of orangish when it's growing and um, it, it's golden toward the fall. <clears throat> Ferns are also another option for a buffer area. They're easy to grow. They like shade. They like wet spots um, and they, they can do a, then they're deer resistant. And so that can be a good addition to a riparian area. Here's just three herbaceous plants. There's an awful lot of herbaceous plants out there. Um, these are just three that would work really well in a riparian zone. This is pink turtle head. Uh, there's a white turtle head. This is a cultivar. It likes wet areas and shade where turf won't grow anyway. Um, the, the second one is Amazonia or blue star. And the third one is common milkweed, a host plant for monarch butterflies and a nectar source for many, many insects. So woody plants are also a possibility. Uh, here's a riparian um, tree planting area. You can see white tree tubes and those stay on about two or three years to protect the tree until it can grow up big enough. Uh, from, it can protect from wildlife. And, um, and, and so you'll often see those at reforestation areas. And, and generally, we recommend those for new small tree planting. You can also use bio logs and you can you can insert live branches uh, with made cut specifically from trees that will root when you put them in there. Uh, and these go stream side or lake side and the 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 live stakes just get inserted right in the bio logs. Uh, you can also uh, impregnate these with uh, grass uh, native grass seeds. And I'll show you some more pictures in a few minutes. Um, we did some really successful uh, live staking of a, a stream in a uh, riparian area in Manassas. And we just ended up driving a piece of rebar in with a mallet. And then you put the uh, live uh, tree, tree branch that's cut specifically to root. And you put that in in the hole that you've just made, and then you fill it, you know, you push it back together with soil. So here's some other ones in place. These look like they might have some um, uh, native grasses in them. Here's a riparian um, buffer project where, where the uh, volunteers are planting along the buffer. And you can see they have that the, the tall grasses, and then they have probably the brighter green is sedges, and then they're putting some trees and shrubs in. So here's some a gentleman putting in a live stake. He's driving in the rebar first, and then he'll put the um, branch that's specially cut into the hole, and that that will root and grow right next in the riparian area. Here's another biolog. This has some perennials behind it, and uh, the biolog is also um, it's got sedges in it, so that that's a that's a plant that likes shade and likes wet areas. And behind it, it's protecting 
uh, the herbaceous plants they put in behind it from washing away. So it's it's not only a um, a medium for uh, plants to grow in, but it's also forms kind of a boundary. Here's another one. These are these are not turf grasses that you see here. They're they're sedges or native warm season grasses, and then you have layers behind that of shrubs and some some trees. So check dams are also a possibility. They're relatively expensive and relatively easy to install. It can be with rock, but I prefer to, to use uh, a um, a tree trunk. Um, to, oops, excuse me. A tree trunk, uh, a down tree. We certainly have a lot of those after this this year's storms. Uh, wood can be used. It's effective mainly for down to prevent down cutting or erosion and channels down a very down a down a slope uh can't be for steeper than greater greater uh can't be for steeper than 10 percent slope so um but you can also reseed behind it and that will prevent erosion while the seed is starting to establish so it can be a temporary thing but and fairfax county is using them north carolina state here's a couple resources that have some more information on using check dams uh pennsylvania um, in their stormwater manuals, they're teaching people how to how to use check dams. So I've talked a lot about natives. I would I want you to um, consider using only natives uh, and Northern Virginia natives. Uh, they're adapted to local conditions, and frankly, our pollinators depend on local plants. Um, something that comes from Minnesota. Um, will not come with the pollinators that go with that plant. Some some pollinators require a specific native plant. And um, in order to have the benefits of predatory or parasitoids or uh, pollinators, the three Ps, in order to have those, we have to have native plants to provide the ne their needs. Planted in the right place, they need less water. They will need irrigation initially. Um, and they take a lot less care than a lawn. A lawn will need to be fertilized once a year, test soil tested every three years, maybe lime applied, um, and it won't grow in a shady area. Um, and again, that's they support our wildlife and they have deep roots that filter rainwater and slow it down. So here's the green book that I mentioned before. That if you put the Google terms in the green book for the buffer, and and the link for it is also at the end of this publication in the resources. Um, it has some really nice riparian landscape plans available. I'm going to show you just a few for examples. Um, this is called, they each have a name. This is the Fall Glory Custer Garden. And it has all native plants. It has a, a red maple here as a canopy tree. And then understory, it has this um, lovely um, um, Virginia sweet spire with the white blooms fragrant uh, loved by pollinators and then butterfly weed below that that on the lower level um, is this one's a uh, butterfly weed is a is a type of milkweed and you can see it tells you how many plants you need what size you need how many square feet what the sun conditions are and it gives you a little diagram Here's another one. This one's called the Spring Beauty Cluster Garden. So pinks and purples. We have a red bud here and a native pinkster azalea, American Beauty Berry with the purple berries on it and the geranium. And this is for more uh, partial sun to shade. And again, you you have all the um, st um, stats here for everything you would need for this and how many square feet it would fill. Here's another one with some choke cherries and magnolias, um, a viburnum. And um, so this is um, some white flowering uh, plants. Um, here's another one. This is a, a, a beautiful four seasons of interest. Um, in the middle, you have a, a beautiful um, maple. Uh, and to the bottom right um, is a baptisia. And that's a, a 
it's more of a sub shrub. It's a it's a large perennial. And up at the top on the right, blueberries and blueberries after they give you fruit, they turn a beautiful red gold in the fall months. They're a great landscape plant plant uh, all the way around. And on the left uh, lower, you'll see a deciduous holly, winterberry holly um, that uh, loses its leaves and has red berries for birds on the bare branches. <clears throat> Here's another one. Um, this one has a crab apple and a, a red bud and um, woodland phlox and a magnolia. So there's some sources for riparian buffer plants. The Department of Forestry offers assistance to landowners. Um, and they also sell trees, and they're very inexpensive. You often have to buy a lot of them. Um, so, so you could go in with your neighbors that are establishing buffers and order a very reasonably priced, a couple dollars a piece. But they are bare root. They're a single branch. They're a single trunk with um, roots coming out of it. They're very easy to plant, um, but they do need some some. TLC and, and consistent watering to establish. There are garden designers though, should you not want to go it alone, you can find a professional that's well versed in native plants at either of these sources, but there also are private practice uh, landscape designers that specialize in native plants. This is the Chesapeake Bay Landscape Professionals. They have a list of uh, people that um, are really well versed in stormwater, rain gardens, native plants, and Plant Nova Natives also lists a bunch of uh, professionals that are available. So the cost is dependent on the plants chosen and the conditions of the property. Some properties may need more engineering and you may need to actually get somebody who has engineering experience that could, that could give you, um, consult and, or, or you know, help with installation. Not mowing is the cheapest, easiest solution. Getting some kind of taller grass, not an invasive grass, but a native grass, and putting it in and leaving it alone. Um, sitting and enjoying the lake view rather than you know, doing your mowing chores. Um, it's about, for, a, for an acre of native grasses, it's about 233 an acre, but none of us have that much um, lakefronts lakefront area. So it's considerably less than that. And there's a couple of uh, good native seed distributors that, um, uh, that have Virginia native grasses. Of course, larger trees and shrubs are more expensive than those small bare root ones from the Department of Forestry. Bare root trees are usually $2 to $6 a tree, um, but uh, bald and burlap, you know, are $35 and up for even a small 1.5 inch caliper plus the installation. And I would urge you to make sure it's installed correctly. Trees are expensive and most trees are planted wrong. The basket should be removed. The uh, burlap should be removed. No staking is needed unless it's on an incredibly steep slope. Um, and here are some um, sources for, um, for, uh, for, for some guidance on um, cost uh, for a riparian buffer. So getting a good quality plant, you know, be a conform, uh, an informed consumer, look for a healthy tree with a single trunk, unless it's a multi-trunked um, type of species, and make sure it doesn't have any wounds in it. Um, look at the roots, make sure they look clean and healthy, they, that they do, don't have a smell, that um, you should be able to see that flare out at the bottom. Uh, above the soil line, otherwise the tree will be compromised. So um, you can take um, take these notes with you when you go to look for a tree, because most trees in garden centers are not that healthy. Box stores even less so. And you want to protect your investment. Make sure it's planted right. You want this flare above the soil line to protect that sensitive area and um, trees that don't have that uh, have a premature death that, that, that don't have that flare above the soil line we can help you with plant selection um, and you can email us there's our email mastergardener at pwcgov.org 
you can take a look at some color pictures online. They have a, a Plant Nova Natives guide online that's fun to look through. I use it almost every day. Make sure it's planted right and make sure it's irrigated until it's established. And when and when there's not sufficient rain, it needs a soaking rain once a week or irrigation. And make sure it's mulched right. No mulch volcanoes. Keep the mulch away from the trunk and keep it, you know, one to one to two and a half, three inches, no higher, and keep it away from the trunk. So I, I'm gonna urge you to consider some action items. I'm, I would recommend that you have a community-wide push for smart lawn care at the right time of year through our Best Lawns program. We're not doing this for um, to, to make money. We're doing it because of water quality. That's what the Best Lawns um, program is based on. And this will reduce excess nutrients going into Lake Montclair if you're if residents will um, abide by the, the recommendations we provide. I would recommend considering a community buffer planting project where, where we came out and helped with your volunteers to demonstrate a beautiful riparian buffer, um, perhaps in fall 2022 is a possibility. And maybe you could offer a, um, a special deal of low cost native trees and shrubs to residents through that Virginia Department of Forestry riparian um, list. Uh, and then maybe we could uh, come and do a demonstration on how to plant trees correctly. Uh, maybe a community class and we would support any of these options for residents using native plants in their landscape with a focus on lakeside properties and continue public education about no phosphate fertilizer, uh, fertilizing in the fall, not fertilizing in the spring, uh, not mowing to the edge, all of the things we've been discussing here. And we can help you with materials for that too, for your newsletter, your website, your social media sites. So um, we can, again, this is what, what VCE can help you with. Um, and do your part through your social media channels, your newsletters to inform and enforce uh, the policy uh, for our RPAs, for a riparian zone. Um, I don't doubt that you guys can come together, you are thoughtful, you are committed, and you can change the progression of um, nutrients going into Lake Montclair and really messing up your, not only your recreational um, venue, but also um, adding risk uh, to your health. These are some resources that you can find um, uh, online. There's the green book for the buffer that I mentioned, but there's lots of great uh, information on habitat and native trees and riparian planting. Um, I want to call your attention to uh, Prince William Conservation Allowance Town Hall. That will be thir Thursday, um, June 2nd, uh, 7 to 9 p.m. You do need to register. It'll be... Um, it, it's not about Lake Montclair, but it's a, about the uh, the health of our Occoquan Reservoir, our drink, your drinking water. So you can register um, by going to the Prince William Count, Prince William Conservation Alliance website. And now I'm open to some questions. So not many questions uh, on here. I have to admit a few a few comments. And uh, there was one, let me just answer one question about algae blooms. We don't currently have an algae bloom. Um, we do have some recent tests that came in that showed that we had some, uh, some cyanobacteria at a, a very low level that doesn't right. even come close. So, um, so I, since nobody else has any questions here, I don't think they do. Let me just add to that. Right now, we don't. We've had cool weather, and we've had, you know, I mean, it, it, as as the weather gets hotter, remember those layers will will occur in the lake, and it the top part will be warmer, and the conditions will change. So I'm not, you know, I I suspect that over time that that. Uh, algae is or the cyanobacteria is gonna 
um, grow. I suspect you're right. Um, and so I got a, uh, I got a couple of questions for you. Uh, there's one that just came in actually, would a pump or, or an aerator uh, help? We often get suggestions about putting pumps or mixers or sprinklers, not sprinklers, uh, fountains in, in the lake. Um, what, what, what are your thoughts on those kinds of devices? You know, we're talking a, a huge lake. Um, I, I don't think it would be effective. Um, you know, Sumner Lake in Manassas City does that, but that's a small lake. This, this is a lot of acreage. So, and to me, that's a Band-Aid. You know, that, that's, a, that's a solution um, that's, not, that's not getting at uh, where, where the pollutants are coming from. They're coming from lawns that are cut too short, lawns that are over-fertilized, pet waste, um, sedimentation, you know, because there's no buffer in, some, in a lot of areas around the lake. So that's, that's my opinion. Okay, thanks. Uh, there's a, I don't think I understand the question. Where can I get the book? Oh, it's, a, it's available online. Uh, you, you could certainly print it. You can download it. Um, that green book is, a, if, so just I, all you have to do is uh, the green book for the buffer. Put that in your Google search and you, it'll pop up. It's a PDF. And, and I'd be glad to, you know, take, once you decide on a, you know, um, that there's one plan that you like in there. I mean, I'd be happy to take a look at it and see if it's, you know, appropriate for your property. Okay, thanks. Um, there's a, another question here that is about geese. Uh, how effective would Canada uh, goose removal be, in your opinion, to combat the overall nutrient overload? Um, I, I think probably a multi-pronged approach is always the best idea for wildlife that taller grass is going to deter them from nesting there and from sticking around long because they're going to be afraid of predators in that tall grass so again the buffer and the 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 filtering um is going to deter the geese from from that area but certainly um going at it from a second way of of removal. And I know you've done some of that, haven't you, Buck? We've done some of that in the past. And um, we coordinate with the Department of Agriculture and Wildlife Services. They will send a biologist out that they haven't done this year yet, but they'll send one out and uh, they'll make a determination whether it's worthwhile to, um, to remove geese. They've given us advice that about 25 geese, permanent geese on the lake would be about right for the size lake that we have. So, you know, unless we start approaching numbers double to that or more, then I, I don't think we would consider it. And, and the wildlife services guys don't, uh, don't recommend it's not worth their time to come out and just collect a few. Yeah. So it, it's a program that, that we've kind of got set up, but not one that we use very often, I have to admit. It's been several years since we even looked at it. So Scott asked if we can get a copy. I, I'd be glad to send a PDF. We're going to send the recording link to you, Scott, and um, it can be posted. It'll be on our YouTube channel. It might be a delay of a couple weeks, though, because my, uh, my boss who edits things for us is going to be out of the country. So, um, but, but here's what I want to offer, too. We do, we, one of our deliverables to watershed um, for my position is, is site visits. And I, I don't have um, unlimited time or energy, but we do do some site visits. So we, we came to the island homeowners and um, gave some recommendations on how, you know, an effective buffer for, you know, three or four properties at once. So I, I am perfectly willing to do that. Um, and um, and continue this conversation. This isn't a one and done deal. I'm, we're happy to support this effort. We think it's really important. 
Nancy, that was an outstanding presentation. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for it. And you have some people in attendance tonight saw how important it is. We'll be getting a copy of the recordings and providing it to the community and really encouraging our people to see it. So thank you so very much. I I am happy to do it, but I I I hope that this is just the start, you know, because this is doesn't have to be a complex, expensive solution. And Buck has done a fabulous job on the late committee. And and I I I just think he needs support. Um, and and I know you guys want a healthier lake. Uh, Nancy, I got a couple of uh, more questions. These are questions for me, actually. Although I, <laughs> you can see I'm glad the, to hear that. <laughs> I don't know if you can see the discussion on the 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 chat. I, I uh, yeah, I'm looking at it now. Um, and anyway, I want to ask about um, the biolog demonstration uh, area. We'll we'll look hard to find an area that we could do that at. There's several places uh, that have riprap already installed. Mm -hmm. And if we were going to do a demo, do you think we'd have to take the riprap out and install the biolog? No, 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 I don't think so. But, you know, not being an engineer, I would want to run that by a couple of my colleagues and, and see what they thought about that. Um, I would think... Um, I don't know how effective the riprap is. You know, we it it would be an iterative process to 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 look at, you know, the factors that are at that spot. But I think it would be easier to do one. Um, you know, a common area would be great, and and pairing it with some kind of community activity that's already going on. You know, I'm, you know, thinking ahead. You know. Fourth of July, uh, Labor Day, some, something that something that people are out and about that you could, you know, look at this solution, how easy it is and how pretty it is. Um, okay, and I want to ask about uh, submerged aquatic vegetation. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure how we're doing in the lake uh, for that, but... Um, I wonder if there's something that we could introduce that would be a native aquatic vegetation that would help with uh, sucking up the nutrients in the water that could compete with with the algae. Um, well, I, there are some native um, SAV plants that would be um, available commercially, but um, just recently, like in the, the last summer, I got a couple calls from with pictures of some native plants that have had gone crazy, and they ended up, up having to rake rake them out. You know, so you, what? That's something you you don't want to have happen. It, it's it's almost better to prevent the to prevent it from going in in the first place before it even gets to that point. Okay, talk me out of it. And, and Larry, that Larry, that's a great point. Being fertilizer, it's against against re, the law to put phosphorus fertilizer if you're not establishing a new lawn. Nobody should be using a product with phosphorus in it for their lawns. Okay, it it should say zero for that NPK um, formula on the label. So so tell your you know pass the pass the information on. I don't know that, you, you know, I think your board has to decide to enforce it, uh, Laura. Uh, I mean, I, I don't envy that because people have strong opinions about lawns. But I, I think it's very important um, that that be done. Any other questions? Uh, um, Nancy, I have a couple, if you don't mind. This is sure. Tim Smith. Sure. <clears throat> um, thank you so much for doing this. I think it's been a great presentation. Um, there was a uh, statement that you made, and I just wanted to clarify it. It, it mentioned temperatures above 75 degrees. And my, my 
curiosity, if you will, was, is that 75 degrees water temperature or 75 degrees air temperature? I'm thinking water, but I don't know for sure. Yeah, I, th I think from that, from reading that article, um, that research, I think it was 75 degrees air temperature. Of course, the water temperature is going to be warmer. Cooler. Warmer. It, it, like like in the in the winter when i monitor streams uh all the aquatic insects want to be in the stream because the it, the stream is warmer than okay all right all right well and, and but I'm, I'm thinking in the summertime the air is going to be warmer than the water yeah well so i'm thinking in the summertime it's i think it, the intent probably was 75 degrees water temperature you, in the you summertime could be right yeah but okay so i was curious about that um I already looked, linked to the green book. I, I think that's great. Um, I just wanted to mention there's, there's a lot of other links you provided in your presentation. I look forward to receiving the recorded copy of that so I'm able to access them. Mm -hmm. um, I, this, can, I can this, actually send that out with the evaluation. I, I, yeah, I, and, and the reason I bring that up is in the previous presentation you did, you did I never got the recorded copy. I wasn't able to attend, um, and I didn't get the, the link to the recorded version of it, so I wanted to make sure I got it this time because you provided a lot of resources that we can look at. Um, this focused a lot on what Montclair can do, and granted, Montclair... Um, has a lot of potential impact to the quality of our water, but it concerns me very much what the impact upstream from Montclair has to our water. Um, we are only one part of a fairly large drainage. Yes. In essence, we are a settlement pond for much of Powell's Creek drainage. So yes, we can do a lot of things and I'm not saying we shouldn't do them, but my concern is there's things that the same things could be up, done upstream from us. And I would hope, I would assume that the county would help to accomplish that. So really, I just wanted to share that. I'm not looking for answer justification or anything like that. I just wanted to share my thought on that. You're, um, you're absolutely right. And it is my hope. Uh, we, we, I, I put an article in the in the county newsletter for external, you know, use around the county, just to that effect, um, that we now have a presentation on this, and we are happy to share it um, with any HOA. Many HOAs are contacting me about. Thank you. you know. thank, thank, thank you. I, I, like I said, I just, I, yeah. I wasn't looking for an answer, but thank you for that. Oh, I just, well. I wanted to share it. Yeah. Um, and then, and the other, the other. I don't know, comment, observation that I have, and I'll get off my soapbox. Um, there, was, there was the mention about the algae accumulation um, contributing to the need for dredging. Yeah. Um, well, I am of the yeah. opinion that no, no matter what happens with algae, Lake Montclair will require regular dredging. And in essence, we are a sediment pond for the Powell's Creek drainage and no matter what we do for algae control, we will still need to dredge on a regular basis. Um, that, 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 that comment or statement was made and a couple of people um, kind of latched onto it in the chat that if we can control the algae, we don't need to dredge. I believe that is incorrect. We are, and so I, I just wanted to put that out in the daylight, if you will. We dredging, are still gonna yeah. need to dredge. Dredging, this, it's a sedimentation. It, not really the algae that that is contributing to the need to dredge and it's the same solution for both you know filtering soaking it in before it gets there and holding that soil tight with a good native plant root systems thank you so much Nancy. you're welcome i appreciate, thank I appreciate you. all your effort on this you're i think it was welcome. a great presentation hey, nancy hey nancy larry lahowitz i have a question ma'am yeah Okay, I've actually got three, to be honest. Well, <laughs> of course I do. <laughs> yeah, first a, a comment. You know, the, your presentation was wonderful. I'm just repeating what everyone says. And you continue to, to be my hero for all the wonderful things you do. Thank you so much. First of all, 
uh, not to make anyone defensive or anything, but I do get concerned because I've sat through a multitude of briefings like this, and afterwards, nothing's happened. Yeah. You know, people turn off the screen and zero happens. So very frankly, if MPOA is serious about the lake, and MPOA I define as everybody from, you know, the newest resident to people who have been here for years and years in our government body, if they're serious about the lake, we need to develop an actionable plan where we can carry these things out and truly save the lake. A quote that I picked from Ned Green after your last briefing was that without the lake, Montclair is nothing more than an aging community. Mm -hmm. you know, thank you for saying that, Ned, but we got to turn that into action if we're going to save the lake. And as you said, Nancy, it's easy to fix the problem now. If we wait until the lake is dead, then it's a very, very difficult problem. Mm -hmm. then if, if you have no feedback on that, the next thing is, I think your idea on a fringe buffer is brilliant. I believe that has been done by a number of lake, lakeside communities. It is proven scientifically to be very effective. We can do that. We really can do that. And as you go around the lake in a, in a boat, you see all of these lawns that go right down to the uh, water's edge and they contribute to the problem. And by establishing a buffer, we could help resolve the issue. Yep. Okay. Exactly. And then, then the third thing is lack of enforcement is a huge problem. Mm -hmm. You know, and that goes all the way from, you know, Montclair to County. You know, people just go out and damage the RPA. They do things that damage the lake and nothing happens. Mm -hmm. You know, absolutely nothing happens. It's sort of like if you had I-95 with a speed limit sign, but the cops didn't enforce it. People will be driving 100 miles an hour. I mean, it's just obvious. Children know that. But we don't have an enforcement mechanism. And so even if we would go and implement your brilliant ideas without an enforcement mechanism, there are always those that would undo what we're trying to do. So You're depending on altruism. Yes. And, there, and there's, in fact, it's kind of interesting, but social scientists tell us that upwards of 10% of the population is pathological. You know, so I don't say that people are all bad, but there's just some people that need more than a little nudge to follow the rules and to save our lake. Yes, good points, Larry. Good points. Um, and, and so, you know, that's a huge responsibility for your, for your board. And I am so appreciative that there are leaders on your board that are listening and concerned and care about the environment and care about their community. Um, Nancy, I, I think it's just getting to be uh, comments on the uh, <laughs> chat. Okay. Yeah, and, and and Jim, you're right. Um, sure. There is there is a a move to use logs. You know, especially with all the trees that fall down in in um, in storms, instead of hauling in rocks, uh, using the wood that's already available there to create, you know, check dams. Um, Pennsylvania um, uses uses that effectively. Landscape architects are are recommending that you know use what's available. So good good point, Jim. I am happy to stay on and answer any questions um, or yeah. not. <laughs> well, we don't want to keep you too late, Nancy. We appreciate you, your uh, your time and thanks for putting the uh, the thing together. And sure. uh, I, I know you spent uh, hours doing this kind of stuff, and not just for us, but for all over the county. Okay, and, and Buck, I would, for you and Linda and Larry, I would repeat this, okay? So if you need it repeated, you know, just let me know, okay? Um, okay, all okay. right. Look forward okay. to talking to you. Have a very good night, you all, and thank you so much for your concern for the environment. I appreciate it. Thanks, Nancy. Thank you. Good night. If you enjoyed this video, 
Please let us know your questions, comments, and suggestions for other classes and videos. For more information on water quality, stormwater, lawns, gardens, landscapes, etc., contact the Extension Horticulture Help Desk at mastergardener at pwcva.gov. Thank you, and we'll see you all the next time.